Chapter 19, The Return. For a long time, Poppy gazed at the lifeless body of Mr. Ocox. She thought she should be feeling triumphant joy. Plain gladness would have been good enough. Somewhere she did feel pride, but small as she was, it was buried deep. What Poppy felt was weariness, as if she had aged four seasons over the last hour. She felt old. Before her, on the grass, lay one of Mr. Ocox's feathers. Poppy had never really looked at an owl feather. This one was quite lovely. It was a mottled brown color with a white tuft on the top, soft as any baby's breath. She picked it up. In the breeze, the veins stirred slightly. With a sigh, Poppy slipped the feather into her sash. Then she turned and looked at the cornfield. At first, she thought what she most desired was to lie down and sleep. It was growing dark. But a moment's thought made her realize sleep was impossible. What she needed to do was to tell someone about her discoveries and what had happened. She crossed the dirt road and moved along the edge of the forest. There was enough of the porcupine's lingering scent for Poppy to find the trail that a wreath had used to go from his home to the field. For once, and it made her smile wanly, she was grateful for the old fellow's stink. Plunging directly into Dimwood Forest, Poppy traveled slowly, methodically, taking taking time for proper precautions. Now and again, she paused to absorb the lush view, the way moonlight flittered through the fragrant air, a very tall tree, a particularly beautiful fern, and a bush laden with blackberries as big as her head. When Poppy reached a wreath's log, she paused long enough to contemplate Mr. Ocox's now abandoned snag. Who, she wondered, would live in it now? A wreath, she called into the log from the entryway. Are you home, a wreath? In response, there was some scratching and snorting deep within. Is that you, a wreath? Who the snail squirt is that? Came the growled reply. Can a creature have any privacy around here? Beat it unless you want to eat a quill sandwich. Arise, it's me, Poppy. Who? Oh, don't you remember? Poppy. Poppy! Came the echo, with more enthusiasm than before. A great rattling and shuffling could be heard. Then a wreath's grisly, flat face loomed out into the darkness. That you really, girl? Where is it? Where's what? The salt. Didn't you bring it? A wreath. It's about Mr. Ocox. He... I don't give a fleece flick for that jerk of an owl. Where's that salt you promised me? It's there, by Newhouse. All broken up on the ground. On the ground? A wreath shrieked. What's doing there? A wreath. I couldn't carry it. And besides... On the ground, great snail swoggle? It'll melt to nothing. The porcupine came barreling by so fast, Poppy leapt a leaped aside. The next moment, he was all but running down the trail. Can I sleep here? And stop the talk, a wreath called back. And indeed, he was gone. Poppy stepped into the log, lay down, and was asleep at once. She slept until the sun was high, and when she awoke, a wreath had not yet returned. So she went out, found some seeds, ate them, returned to the log, and slept again until dusk. This time, when she awoke, a wreath was there. He was chewing in a roisterous, slobbering way on a chunk of salt. Hello, Poppy said. A wreath didn't even look up. Delicious! Best salt I ever had! He licked his lips. Awesome! Then you got some of it? Some of it! All of it! I'm just about ossified. This is the last bit. It was pure, wonderful salt. 
absolutely delicious, amazing, divine. Reese, what's that? Did you see Mr. Ocox? No, oh, yeah, him dead. What happened? Poppy told him. The porcupine, though busy with the salt, slowed his slobbering to listen. When Poppy finished her story, she asked Arif, What do you think? Arif shook his head. Never thought I'd appreciate that owl's hard head. But if what you say is true, it is. Well, I'm grateful he broke up this salt lick. Really, Poppy, it's incredible stuff. Want some? I mean, a small taste. A wreath. What's that? I'm going home now. May I come back and visit? Sure, Poppy, sure. Anytime. And bring some salt. I'm going now. Poppy. What? You're the salt of the earth. Poppy crossed Glitter Creek by using the bridge. The rest of the way, she traveled by the side of the tar road. By the time she reached Gray House, it was late. The first thing she noticed was that the red flag was flying. She climbed the porch steps slowly. Instead of going right inside, she took a peek. The entire family was gathered in the front parlor. Longworth stood atop the old straw hat, apparently in the middle of a speech. And so, dear friends, we will have to break up the family. Yes, disperse, go our separate ways, forage on our own. There is insufficient food for us here. But first, I wish to engage in a brief memorial tribute to our full family. Which, Poppy? Is, is that you, Poppy? She stepped inside. All the mice turned to stare. Poppy gazed at them evenly. Then she pulled the feather, Mr. Ocox's feather from her sash, and held it aloft for all to see. Mr. Ocox is dead, she said solemnly. And I can tell you that Newhouse is right next to a big field of corn that has enough to feed us all forever and ever. Ah, uh, Poppy, Longworth cried triumphantly. Didn't I say that if you listen to my advice, all would be well? Chapter 20 A New Beginning Almost 13 full moons to the night since Mr. Ocox killed Ragweed. Poppy and her husband, Rye, how they met and married, is another story, stood on Bannock Hill with their litter of 11 young mice. They had formed a circle around a small hazelnut tree. Looking on beneath a full golden moon was a wreath of porcupine. This tree, Poppy was saying to her rather restless children, was planted after a fashion by my late and dear friend Ragweed. I can't be sure that it was he who dropped the seed nut from which this tree is grown, but I would like to think so. Though it is rather frail now, someday this tree will be mighty. I want to affix this. Here she held up a small earring to a high branch so that as the tree grows, it will glitter in the sky for all of us to see. Hey, does Ma like making long speeches or does she? Whispered one of the litter to one of her brothers. And here on Bannock Hill, Poppy went on, once forbidden to us, though we too live in Dimwood Forest, we shall have our dancing place. It doesn't matter how you dance, my children, slow or fast, by jumps or steps, as long as you are free to dance in the open air by the light of the moon, all will be well. Now, a wreath, if you please. Hold a wreath, murmuring, mouse muck, under his breath, gave a grunt, but began to shake and rattle his quills 
until he settled into a steady beat. Then the eleven young litter mice began to dance their own way, with jiggles and jumps and leaps and lopes. As for Poppy and Rye, they spun round and round in a stately waltz, dancing by the light of the moon and the earring, which glittered high on the hazelnut tree. And that is the end.